Hello and good afternoon and welcome to KAZ TV Radio Network. I am Tim White of Unlocking the Power View. Thank you for being with us today. We have some amazing guests with us. We'll be getting to them in a, in a moment or so, but I'm going to do something I don't usually do, and that's a, a public service announcement just because we have some people out there who have been helping us with what we're doing. That's Mr. John Derrick Hair Studio, 12200 Fair Hill. <laughs> And he has a number of my books in his shop, and he's been a good marketer for the books, pu yes. pumping them out there. We also have Trial Brother Tailoring, and it's 5622 on Libby Road, Warrensville. He does a great job out there. He also is sponsors some of our books in his, his tailoring shop. Also, there's a disclaimer. We want everybody to know I'm not here trying to be a doctor or not a lawyer or not an attorney. So many of the uh, uh, thoughts expressed are going to be our own and no one else's. But we want you to know there are services out there available for those who might be going through some situations and hardships and don't know who to turn to. One of which is the Department of Veterans Affairs. And one of the people you can reach out to is Miss Deborah Williams, and she's on Warrensville, 5310-and-a-half, Warrensville Road. And with that also, I want to make this announcement, too. If you're not wearing these masks, and I want to talk about masks, people are dying at an alarming rate, and we need to do better with our helping one another. It's not about you, but it's about them. If you haven't been vaccinated, get vaccinated. It's not going to hurt you. It's not something done as a political scheme to hurt and to harm you. It's to help the society, help the country. And the last thing I want to say before we get started, the book, this because my people over on the background here looking at me like, you don't mention the books often enough. Well, this is the book. This, <laughs> this is one of the books. Lynching, Rope No Longer Required. This is the latest one in the marketplace right now. And in this book, we talk about all the lynchings that have happened to black men, women, and children by the police department. We're not talking about defunding as much as we are challenging them to change the mindset within the uh, the departments. So it's unlocking us. We're talking about unlocking the power of you, but this book, please go out and get it. Help us to help one another. So we want to thank you for that. Also, this podcast is on, it's on Roku TV, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Amazon Fire TV and many others. So I don't want my, my guests to get nervous, but they're going to be seen by a lot of people. So <laughs> They're smiling like, I don't know, this is a nervous smile, but I think we're ready. So with that, I want my guests to introduce themselves. We're talking to women in the military. We had a great time last week with the men in the military. And this week, we want the women to share a little bit about themselves and what branch of service they were in. And then we're going to jump into the questioning portion of it. Starting to my immediate left is... Roberta Pace, United States Coast Guard. Kathleen Edley, United States Coast Guard. Tanya Pickett, United States Army. Well, I, I say say something about yourself. That, that's almost like name, rank, and serial number. Then wait now. Huh? <laughs> you, you can say a little bit more. <laughs> I, I want this, the audience to get to know who you are. With not that, not that they know your name, <laughs> all of your names. Now tell us a little bit about what. I'll start off with this question. Then. Tell us a little bit about why you went into the military. Well, I went in the uh, Coast Guard in 1973 because the, um, the officer that worked with me, I worked at a, another company, and he was recruiting females in, in, in the Coast Guard and um, in the reserve program. So I started out in the reserves um, from 1973 to 1981, and then I went active. And um, it was a part-time job for me because I was, you know, I was single and I had children, so it was extra money. That's the, that's the reason why I went into the Coast Guard. Okay, that, now that's an interesting thing that you would say. I went to the Coast Guard because I had children, and I, it was extra income. That was the... The driving force, yep. or was it something other than that you just looked at it and said, you know, it would be nice to be in the military in the service? Or? I had wanted to be in the Marines, but I was too old. And when um, the reason why I wanted to be in the, a Marine was because my birthday is November 10th, which is the birthday of the Marine Corps. So, um, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't, um, I was too old for that. And when Mr. Roberts told me about um, 
the, the Coast Guard Reserve Program. They called it REBI at that time, Reserve Enlisted Basic Indoctrination. And um, the main, the primary mission for the Coast Guard at that time, I don't know what it is now, but it was to save lives. And I didn't want to go to a, a branch of the service that all they did was, you know, fight. The Coast Guard's mission is to save lives, and that's what I wanted to do. Okay, we're going to come back to that, just that aspect in itself, and say I wanted to save lives. Uh, and, and that's important for all of us to, to know. Now, you say you were too old to get into the uh, Marines. Mm-hmm. But you weren't too old to get into the Coast Guard. Not, how, as, a, how not as a reservist. Okay, as a as reservist. As a reservist. Um, and um, because it was only one weekend out of the month and two weeks during the year. And um, you could take time off from work to go to a reserve training. So I thought it was a, you know, a pretty good deal. So. so it was pretty much like it was a part-time job then. It was. It, 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 it was a part-time job. It, it's just a job I'm going to on the uh, weekends. And yep. I'm a, a warrior on the weekends, yep. and I come back home, and I have my uh, normal life. Yep. At least for a moment. Right? And then, I don't know, it got good to me. So. Okay, what do you mean by got good to you? What, <laughs> what does good I, mean? I wanted to go active. I wanted to, you know, and it was, it was all... It was all Admiral Danielson's doing. That was the Admiral I worked for at the time. And um, Mrs. Edley knows who he is. And so um, he kept not baiting me, but all the good things that would come out of it if I went active. And because I would have been a company commander and... He said that would be be good for my career, so I did it. Okay, and we know you became a company commander. We're going to come back and we're <laughs> going to talk about that because you have some pictures you want to share with us as well. And and that's it's unusual because uh, we're looking at you as all black women. I know it was not easy necessarily going to the military, being a black woman, being a woman, period. Yeah. But then being a black woman in the military, and you had some ranking, and you had some men that had to go along with the program. I know men aren't always necessarily like to be told what to do by a woman. Always. So, so what's that? I said sometimes. Always. You said we always. always. <laughs> and none of the men in here say uh, anything. They just always. To us. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so we'll come back to that. Well, so, I just want something ahead. I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. um, and because I'm, I'm old now, I, I forget stuff. But um, we'll come back to it later. I'm sorry. You didn't have to do with uh, men, did it? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably. But I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, they laugh like it's okay for she be got if it's about men then. All right. So, Miss Miss <laughs> Kathleen, your reasons. What happened that you ended up in the military? I have to piggyback on uh, Roberta. I worked for the Coast Guard as a civilian. I, I worked for them because I found out the Coast Guard paid your salary when you took off sick. And when I graduated from uh, John Adams, I was one of the first black females that worked at Ohio Bell. But when you took off from Ohio Bell, so did your check. Mm. So I took the exam for uh, civil service and I met, once I got the job, I met this lady who was my very best friend throughout the Coast Guard, Alberta Peterson, and she told me about joining the reserve. And I actually joined it because I liked the uniform. <laughs> <laughs> the, the lady next door, one of the, the ladies that was in the reserve used to come next door to my mom's house, and she had on her... Bravo uniform with mm -hmm. the red stripes, and I thought, oh, I like that. So at that time, you had to have your husband sign for you to join. That was way back in the dark ages. And um, yep, 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 yep. <laughs> I told him if he didn't sign, I was going to forge his name. So okay. He, he went on and signed, <laughs> and I joined. 
So I had, just like she did, I did all of my career, uh, 26 years in the reserve, uh, unlike Bobby going active duty, because I had three three children, and I wasn't going to leave them at home with their dad because it was a little <laughs> wild. I was just not going to do that. But my basic uh, reason for joining was the uniform. You know, it's, it's amazing. You said, I want to go in there part-time because the money, and you want to go in there because, I, I like that uniform. It looks pretty good. I want to wear one of those things. Now, you mentioned Bobby. No, Now, our audience may not know who Bobby is, so Bobby is the person who's sitting at your right hand who's a friend. Uh, and to those who are watching, we didn't know that they knew each other before they came in. When they come in, it was like a reunion uh, yes. uh, because you were both Coast Guards. So Bobby is... Roberta. Roberta. And saying so everybody in the Coast Guard only knew me as Bobby. Okay. So, so that's that's Miss Bobby. Right. That's Miss Bobby. All right, so we're going to go down and we're going to find out from Miss Tanya if the, she went in because the money was good <laughs> or she just liked the uniform. So Neither. <laughs> okay. Um, I was 17 years old when I went in. Uh, if my mother didn't sign for me to go, I wouldn't have been able to go to the next year. But she knew I really wanted to, so she did. Um, before you go actually, any further, before you go any mm-hmm. further, because that that's an important, it's a key component. Mm-hmm. You are a minor, yes. So you needed permission to go in, yes. Now you ask mom to do it. How did she feel about it? Because I know most parents say, "I don't want my child mm-hmm. in the military," especially mm-hmm. when you are a minor. Right. So what was it like for you to talk to her and say, "Mom, I really want to uh, go into the service"? Well, I was always independent. As a child, I was. I just always did things on my own. And I actually, gra- I skipped the eighth grade, so I was graduating a year early. And she, the rec- actually, the recruiter was coming to my house for my older, my brother that's a year older than me. And somehow I was the one who went in and not him. <laughs> so I, my, my goal originally was not to go into the military. It was after the recruiter coming to my house numerous times for my brother and me signing the paper. <laughs> Still don't know how that happened. But I think the main reason they was talking about the money that you could get to go to college. And that was the main reason that I went in. And Here so we go. it's the money that's, again. That's, <laughs> that's, that, so that's how I talked my mother into doing it was because of the money for college. Okay, so m- your mom didn't mind doing it because she understood, okay, I don't have to come up with money for college now. Right. The, the service is going to pay for that right. for her. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's, that, that's a good thing. There was eight of us, so um, we needed the money for college. Eight of you? <laughs> yes. My How oldest, many went into service? My oldest brother was in Vietnam. He served some terms there. And um, my other brother was in the National Guard, so I had two. Others. Okay, and now we had... Two Coast Guards, that was by choice. Why did you choose the Army to uh, to do, or a, rather than a Coast Guard or the Navy? I don't know why I chose the Army over the rest of them. I honestly don't know. It wasn't a, it was, it was, I didn't think of any other one but the Army. I don't know. Okay, well, that's, that's. I don't know. <laughs> that's good. You didn't think about the Army? Uh, I mean, and, and you, as you're thinking, and I know I'm, I'm watching that Miss Kathleen is writing things down, so she probably put some notes down there she wants to highlight uh, uh, talk <laughs> right. about, which is, is good. I have senior moments. You have senior moments? <laughs> I know I do. Okay. So when you think about all of you went in, and I mentioned it a moment ago, what was it like? Because when you, you know, going in is one thing. Once you get in, it's another was it what you thought it was going to be like when you entered into the service? Well, it was fine for me when, as a reservist because it was just a part-time job. Now I remember what I wanted to say. When I went active because I had never gone to boot camp because the reserve program you, you went in at a certain uh, rate, I mean, certain rank, according to your, um, which your, your job, whatever you, your job. And I was in a supervisory position at that time, so I went in as a first class. Well, when I got to Cape May, the men did not like me 
being a first class, never gone to boot camp, mm-hmm. and um, and I wasn't doing it to prove myself to them because I didn't care about what they were talking about. I had the, I had the rank. The government gave it to me. They gave me the job to be a company commander, so that's what I was going to do. And um, I had one situation. I shouldn't mention names, should I? No, you can generically mention. Okay. Uh, well, know, it was a, it was a <laughs> an individual. It was a it was a, I think it was a senior chief. It was a chief bosun's mate when I was in uh, boot camp. I mean, when I was in um, as a company commander at, at Cape May, and we were in his squad bay, his office, and we were just talking, and he he mentioned that. What, my, what was my daughter going to do for her summer job? And I told him I didn't know. And then he said, this is what he said to me. I hope I don't start shaking. She can go, she can just go out on the corner, right? And so because there was no one there, it was just he and I, and I knew it would be a he said, she said mm-hmm. moment, I just jumped up at him. And so, because I didn't care. How di- how dare you say that about my child? And um, from that moment on, we were good because, you know, I had a, almost attacked him because I, I, I just didn't care. I just did not care. And so um, that was the, the worst thing that I experienced in the Coast Guard. And it was with that senior chief. And um, but like I tell everybody, I handled it because I just wasn't going down. I I don't know if you remember, Kathy, but remember when the enlisted club was right there on the on the corner? Oh, yeah. And um, we had great times in that E Club. We sure did. <laughs> <laughs> And there was, <laughs> there was, there was, um, you know, there's always a group of folks there. And then we were playing this game. It's probably illegal called quarters. And um, when you shoot the quarter into the drink, if you miss, you've got to, you know, drink everything. So um, unfortunately, there was an army guy there, and. Um, <laughs> He got he got so upset because I kept winning. He said something along the the lines, "Okay, Coast Guard, you do what you got to do because I know you can't do anything." So again, I jump up. I don't know why I do that, <laughs> but I, but I do, and um, and then everybody around me, you know, they were like shielding him from me, like in the scheme of things. It was only God that helped me because I should have been flattened on numerous occasions. But it was it's because I have this thing in my heart that I was in the Coast Guard. I'm a I'm a military person. You people should show respect to me. That's just that's just <laughs> and um my children would tell you when I was in Cape May. My part of my uniform as a company commander, I wore taps, and so anytime I had to go to school or anything like that, my daughter would say, "My everybody hears you coming," and so, but that's just how I roll. I, that's that's just that's just what I do. Now you know, listening to what you're saying, and based on that too, because we know. Militarily, it's more of a man's oh, yeah. world in the military, and you have to uh, assert yourself. In, oh yeah, in, in no uncertain terms, as oh, you yeah. say. But that's how you roll. So it's like, okay, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show them that I'm not backing down because I'm a woman. That's right. And and you mentioned uh, that you uh you I have a picture here, and I want you to show the picture because you're in the uniform there, and <laughs> you're looking kind of tough in the in the uniform in the, uh, the picture there. One? Yes. Oh, this is. When I was in boot camp, I mean, drilling the recruits, and um, I just 
I didn't know somebody took that pr uh, picture, but I was very proud that they did because I see there's one recruit back there. He was looking at his his wrist, trying to make sure he was doing it right. It's a good thing I didn't catch him. Uh oh. Can you get you got that picture there? Yeah, he's got it up there. Okay. So we can see you. And you said that was a surprise snap, huh? It was. I I, I just didn't know. So. I was happy. Now, with that, you're showing it, and I know uh, it's important to know, these are all guys I'm looking at so far in this picture. Oh, yeah. So how, <laughs> how did that go over when you have a bunch of men? Uh, again, no no offense to the guys in the room because, you know, they, she says, you know, y'all, because I'm not in that <laughs> y'all situation. Uh, what is it like when you know you're giving them orders? And I, I know sometimes they have that eye, to cut an eye or look a certain way. I don't and think so. They're, well, the thing is, they have this thing they call when you when you meet your recruits, and you have to not put on a show, but that's your indoctrination to the recruits, what is expected of them. And so um, when I would walk up on stage and identify myself who I was, I would always tell them, I said, now you have a choice. I can either train you or you can just leave. This is not wartime. You have a choice. You chose to come into the Coast Guard. So if you don't want to be in the Coast Guard because of me, go somewhere else. And um, nobody ever said that they didn't want to stay. They, they, they hung in there, so it was all good. They, they, didn't, they didn't pack up and leave, huh? Uh, it was all good. It, it was all good. Yeah. You can show this other picture, and then we're going to move down because I, I know Miss uh, Kathleen's all That's excited me. and ready, too. One of the pictures that they give you that they as a company commander. Okay, so they, they know who you are. Everyone yeah. knows who you are, and, and you're wearing that bar. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I noticed your suit is here. We want you to... Tell well, us a little bit about the, well, the it's, uniform as well. It's red in the, the picture. They call it in the Navy and in the Coast Guard, company commanders, are they have a red rope, and they call them red ropes. Mm -hmm. But this this um, augulet is when I was, um, this is like a dress augulet. And I had it on because it was still in the plastic bag from when I got out of service. <laughs> and... Um, um, I didn't bring my medals because that's just wrong, but this commendation this commendation ribbon has a medal, uh, achievement medal has a achievement ribbon has a medal. This, these are my letters of commendation, and I have a gold star. That's for you know more than one, and these are um, unit citations. That's the reserve. Ribbon. That's the um, purple, purple heart. This is good conduct, and that's um, marksman on the forty-five and on the um, M sixteen. So she is tough. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, don't mess with me. I, you know, we we got some things together. That's absolutely amazing. And I, I don't think I said it to begin. I'm going to say it to you guys now. Thank you for your service. I have a daughter that's been in the military now for twenty, almost 27 years. So this is uh, amazing. So, Miss Kathleen, yeah. we're going to move on down because well, it's like, okay, uh, it's your turn. Huh? <laughs> right. Um, I have to also piggyback on uh, Bob, Bobby. Bobby. Yeah, because I, I, I know her name is Roberta, but like she said, we always called her Bobby. I came in under the same program that she did, but I came in in 1978, January 16th of 1978, and it was called the Direct Petty Officer Program based on your civilian occupation. They no longer had first-class petty officers. She was one of the rare group mm. of really? uh, women. Oh, you, wow. Seal, and um, Pat. Mm -hmm. were in Mill and Benton. Oh, All okay. of you came in under that provisional first class. Oh, okay. I came in as a third class, and you had to exam your way up to first class. So I, I took all exams, and the 
I was the, the third class in the unit. We went to uh, Reby School, and I grew up, I'm the oldest of five daughters, and my father was a pastor, so I was really sheltered. So when I went to Reby School, I was like, I was married, but I had never been away from home. Uh, my parents, uh, my husband, and my and my two kids. So when I went to Reby School, I would drag in right before class the <laughs> next morning <laughs> because I had never been out as an adult on my own doing whatever I wanted, wanted to, to do. So I was just really excited. It was a two week um two week class and it was in Yorktown, Virginia. Mm-hmm. So it was um I could drink. I mean I could do everything. I was just <laughs> like whoa this is this is, this is fun. <laughs> and then as I stayed in the unit I noticed that the more rank you got, the better your uniform looked. It had more red stripes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it had more <laughs> gold. Oh, oh, yeah. And I thought, okay, <laughs> oh, so yeah. let's see what I'm going to do. So I started um, studying, and I made second, then first, and I became the um, administrative officer for the reserve unit. We had 102 people. We had the largest reserve unit in Cleveland. And there weren't, there there are two guys now that were in my unit that also are Elizabeth Baptist Church members. And I met them after I joined church. (laughs) But um, I became um, a chief and my uniform changed from red to go and like I was, oh yeah yeah I was okay <laughs> now I got gold and I have all these um, awards and stripes and I was just it was just like seventh heaven and I also advanced as a civilian employee with um, the Coast Guard so I had a dual role I could go on extended active duty for four to six months, and they had to pay me for military and my civilian job. So I was making money over money. It's all about the money. <laughs> yes, and I got a chance to travel. Mm-hmm. I went to um, Alameda, California. I went to Yorktown, Virginia, Petaluma, California. And <clears throat> during one period, I got a a tour of duty in Europe. Um, I was working for the first black lieutenant in the Coast Guard. Coast Guard is prejudiced still. It was a little bit more then. But um, I was his secretary, so he had, we had to do a stint over in Europe. My husband could go, and he did a tour of Europe for the two weeks that that we were there, I had to work, so I didn't get a chance to see Europe like he did. Mm-hmm. But I just like to listen to the people talk. I love the way English people talk. It's, mm-hmm. it's just so uh, different. And once, um, uh, his na- well, at the time he was a lieutenant, Lieutenant uh, Steve Roshan. He, he later became an admiral after I decided to go from Chief, which is E7, to um, Move it on that side so the camera officer. can see a little bit there. Yeah, yeah. so they, they can see who it is you're referring to. Yeah, this is Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant well, camera. now right Rear here. Admiral. Short to this camera right there. Okay. And pull it Rear over. Admiral Steve Rochon. Pull, pull it over a little bit this side. It's hard to see it. I'm yes, looking it at the monitor. Just show it by your friend. Okay. Put it over this way, so between you two. Oh, yeah. there you go. Okay. Now, I, now we can see it. It's yeah. on the camera. Good there. He is also. He was also the first black chief usher in the White House um, once he retired from the Coast Guard. And what year is that? And that was 2000. He retired, and he became. Uh, at, he became President Obama's. Chief Usher, the first one in the history of the Coast Guard, only one really. And so he invited 
um, myself and my family to a tour of the White House on the other side, not going through the line like everybody <laughs> else did. We actually went into the White House, and you would never believe what the White House looks like on the other side. You just know what you're looking at at TV, but it's it's actually gorgeous. It's just a, a, a very pretty place. So I still keep in touch with him uh, now, and he's um, he's no longer he retired from the White House, but he's uh, a super super good person. Um, yes, you you remember him. I remember. Yeah, my um, my experience in the Coast Guard was uh, it was just phenomenal. I think because I worked in a district office, I wasn't subject to the prejudice that the people in the field were. So mm-hmm. I helped a lot of other blacks that were in the Ninth District. I helped them to progress with the uh, because they. They would call me because they knew I worked in the district office and I could give them information on just hang in there. Don't let them intimidate you and make you get out Mm -hmm. because it it actually, once you retire, it has a lot of good benefits. But they were were just um, so not just because you're a woman, because you were black, because it's basically a white branch of service. And they're, um, yeah, they're, they're just, they're still like that in 2021, mm-hmm. and that just amazes me that you, that's still going on. You know, it, it's, and sometimes, and I notice it's a little bit of hesitation about saying it, but we have to come to the realization racism is still racism and it's still around, it's still prevalent. And there's nothing wrong with yeah. saying that because it's never going to change if we don't bring some attention to that reality. So the, the more you say it, the more we uh, have to put ourselves in a position of understanding it's real and we need to do something about it. We can't do anything about it if we constantly bury our heads in the sand like, oh, you know, that's just the way it is. No, it's the way we allow it to be. Right. So what we have to do is take that stance of what you're doing. And I noticed that Bobby's over here. I'm calling you Bobby now. It's saying that she, <laughs> she's saying, yeah, you know that that's the way it is. And we have to. We have to come to that, that point of understanding. Yeah, you as a woman, it's tough. And then as a black woman, it's tough. And we know, I don't know how many women are, we're going to come back I know Tanya's ready now. She's like, she's eager. So how many women do you see in the military? You know, I know it's, it's a camaraderie. When I saw the two of you, it's like you light up and say, oh, oh that's oh, somebody God. else now. <laughs> so it, it, is it that way in the military? Do you, how often you have that bond in the military with other, do you see that many black women in the military that you can bond with? If you go to the VA. If you go I'm, to the VA. Because I'm at the VA every Tuesday. Um, with um, the Women's Move group, and I try to arrange it if I have any um, appointments on Tuesday. Um, But there are a lot of women in the military, you know, veterans, that rely on the VA because they are trying to take care of us. They really are. And uh, they even have have a new building just for women now, mm-hmm. over on Way Park. Yep, I haven't been there yet, but it's it's a it's the women right there. It's it's separate, and um, because we have different situations, other than the men. And when I used to be in the move group, that was um, men and women. We wouldn't speak up because we can't identify with what the guys go through. Mm -hmm. How could we? And um, so it's better now for women, women veterans. It is. It is good that you say that. And unfortunately, it shouldn't take hardships for uh, people to come together and see that you're struggling and that you have struggled. But it's a step. It's a step in the right direction. Um, we're going to come back to you, Miss uh, Kathleen, so you can talk a, bit, a little bit about those uh, awards.
Or it's on yours, but we need to get Miss Tanya Cozy. She's like anxious. I can see it in her. It's like, please get to me. Please get to me. Hurry up. I have some things to say before I lose them. Don't let me lose them. So, so. Hmm. Um, like I said, I went in when I was 17. That was my first time ever being away from home. Um, I was kind of nervous going in, but my brother, the one that was in the National Guard, before I went in, he told me, he said, it's a head game when you go to basic training. And he said, they're going to be all in your face yelling at you. And then it, behind your back, they're going to be laughing with each other. My first day in, I, I noticed that. They were all in our face yelling at us. And, and when they were, because I'm very observant, so I was watching them. And that's exactly what they did. So from day one, for me, it was easier. I was already real athletic. I used to play basketball. I was always with my brothers. So the physical training part, it was nothing. That was easy. So um, basic training, it was it was actually pretty easy for me. Um, I didn't let the head games get to me. I was up at 4 o'clock in the morning. It didn't bother me because <laughs> I was always early um, going to school. My mother never had to wake us up or any, anything. We, my mother had us shiny shoes when we were younger, ironing clothes. Our clothes was ready the night before. We did the hospital bed. So everything that I had to do in the military, my mother not knowingly, she already trained me for it. So going into the military, it was it was pretty easy for me. It didn't, it was another day. <laughs> so it, that part was easy. Okay, that part. Now, that part was easy. That part was easy. Um, when I went to... My AIT, that's where you go when you're learning your job. Once you leave basic training, what is your job going to be? I was going to be in supply. And so my first day there, there was a staff sergeant, the male staff sergeant. Um, and, you know, they signed us in and everything, and they signed us to our rooms. And he said that he would come back later, and he was going to show us, you know, the town and everything. And me being young, naive, it's what I'm thinking he's going to do. And so he comes in, he picks me. I've never told nobody this story, by the way. This is my first 38 years. This is my first time sharing this. And so he came to pick me up. I'm thinking he's showing me around because I thought that's what they do. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of odd because it was just me. And so I, I went with him, and then he takes, you know, he said he'll go to eat first, and that was fine. I'm still thinking he's going to show me. And so... We went to, uh, it was like a, a Chinese restaurant or something. But I noticed Chinese restaurant was right next to a hotel. And so we ate, get back in the car, and he started trying to touch me inappropriately. And, you know, I made him take me back to the, to the barracks. But I never told anyone that it happened because, like I said, first time away from home, I'm young, male army, and I'm looking like it's going to be my word against his. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of buried it. And the next day, I was coming out of my room. It was Because this was a Friday evening. The next day was a Saturday. And I was coming out of my room, and I saw him coming in, and I ran back to my room and closed the door. And so the, the guy that was there guarding, because it was always, you know, a person guarding the people coming in, and the guy went and knocked on the door for me because he was he came to look for, he came for me and i act like i didn't hear the door and i didn't leave my room until like later on in the evening and the guy said you've been here all this time he said i was knocking on your door earlier and i pretend i didn't hear him and i like i said i, I buried that and i've this is my first time ever telling anyone that that happened well you know what we we appreciate you having the boldness to do that and hey God is who he is, and he knows what you needed, mm -hmm. and he, he, you need to unload that. But with that even being said, women have that stigma attached to them when they're in the military, too. Yes. Guys will look in and say, hey, you know what? You're not worthy of the rank. You're not worthy of the position. So we are the ones in charge, so they feel that they can come in and do what they want to do. And as you said, and I think all of you are saying the same thing, it's your word against theirs. Mm -hmm. That's right. And since it's that male-dominated society – you have an up, uh, uphill battle to try to convince anybody that something like that takes place. Mm -hmm. And we know, looking at the news on a regular basis, it happened 
fairly regularly. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But so it's great. It's great for you to feel that, hey, I'm comfortable enough to share that Mm -hmm. because it means something. And I say that it means something because there's somebody out there, some women who are watching this program are going to say, you know what? That was me. Mm -hmm. That happened to me, too. But who do I tell? Who do I talk to? Who can Mm -hmm. I talk to? And as we say, there's help out there. And you just have to find it. And one of the greatest things you can do is what you guys are doing here. And that camaraderie, getting together and sharing that with one another and say, hey, sister, I know. That's what I was talking about. It's, I know it's a difficult thing in black women in the military because mm-hmm. you have to go through that. You have to suppress some things or repress some things that, are, that has been done to you. I heard you saying, uh, Kathleen, you know, these, these men are doing this. They say this. They're saying that. Yeah, they want to push that on you. So what do you do? You, what, who do you go to then? That was hard. It was <laughs> in the military, it's kind of who do you go to? You know, that's, you suppress a lot of things that happen, and you just keep moving. And, but that also and takes away from your effectiveness. It does. In the military, mm-hmm. in the service, because, uh, and, you know, we talked about it on the program before, bullying. That's a bullying mentality mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. a ranking officer who feel that's like, right. hey, you know what? I can do this, and then nothing's going to be done to me. Mm-hmm. And because I hold a rank, I can say you That's did. Right. Or it's your word against mine. Mm-hmm. So we have to find a way to combat that. And I know that the Veterans Administration, the Veterans Society, they're helping women who are, have gone through that. But it's hard. And again, as I say, I can't emphasize enough. It meant a lot to me for you to say, you know, I've never shared this before, but here it is. So that's a weight that goes away when you, you're able to mm-hmm. share that with somebody. Mm-hmm. And, and we feel honored that you did that. So if anything we can do, we're going to do that. And if we can give you a voice like we're doing today, we're going to give you a voice to say, hey, this is what it is, and talk about that. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to commend you and further continue your, your, your story <laughs> that you were saying. I just want to interject that because it's so important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Um, another, another kind of difficult part, um, I got married when I, while I was in the military, I got, I was, I wound up pregnant, um, after I got married, a few months after I got married. And so when we would do our physical training, I was a roll guard and a roll guard, you run in front of the formation, you stop traffic. Once the traffic stop, you run back in front of the formation. And this is what I did on a regular. I loved it. I always volunteered. And any, anytime they asked, anybody want to roll guard, it was me because I, I enjoyed doing it. And so when I got pregnant, I started falling behind and I couldn't, I couldn't keep up. Mm-hmm. And so I explained to them that I was pregnant. So they said, well, you don't have documentation from the doctor. So they made me keep mm. running. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I went until I was almost four months pregnant. Trying to do the the, the push ups, the the sit ups, the running two miles. It's, it's thank God that I didn't lose my child, but my pregnancy test kept coming back negative, and so because I didn't have documentation, they kept making me do it. And so because I started lagging behind because I was pregnant. If you lag behind during the run in the morning, you had to make up for it in the evening, and so they had me doing that until I was almost four months pregnant, where I actually had documentation to, that showed that I was pregnant. So it took four months of pregnancy before they would, ex- uh, and not just four months of pregnancy, but four months of pregnancy with documentation because your word wasn't good enough. My to them, it seems like enough. you were saying, I just don't want to do this. Right. And yet, your MO was, right. you always did it. I always did it, and I volunteered. Exactly. So when you do didn't it. do it, yeah. to me, now I'm just thinking common sense-wise. Mm-hmm. My common sense would say, if this sister stopped doing it and she's lagging, there must be a reason for this. Right. Let me find out what the reason would be. Mm-hmm. So what you're saying is... The, Whatever reason you gave wasn't a good enough reason. No. And if you say you're pregnant, we need some proof of it. Right. And you didn't give us any proof to four months into the pregnancy. Right. Now we can right. accept certain things. Mm-hmm. Uh, Until my test came back positive. Because you say it came back negative it a couple of co- times. A couple of times. And, and because it came back negative, they made me keep, they kept making me do it. And, and now 
So you're making me think in terms of, okay, when you're saying that, well, that's not my fault that she's pregnant, if she's pregnant. That's how I it wasn't my. It. I didn't have anything to do right. with it. You're, she's in the military. Yeah. Why did she get pregnant? Exactly. It's, you that's you, how you shouldn't have got pregnant. You're in the military. It's exactly. So uh, I look at you ladies. You're like, okay, you want to say something? Go right <laughs> no, ahead. I don't want you to feel you can't say anything. <laughs> this is the place to, sit, to share it. So share. Go on, Miss Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> that's just wrong. It's just wrong. The whole thing is just wrong. Everything that you just talked about, it's just, it angers me. It angers me because it's just, it's just not right. And you were saying common sense. Well, you're dealing with the military. That's not common sense. That's just the way it's been done. This is the way it's been done all the time. And that doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right. It just makes it regular, right? It makes it <laughs> the service. You know, when I was when I was Admiral Danielson's aide, Kathy, I I did the unit citations, right? So I typed I typed all the st all the stuff for the cit citations, and every single time they indicated that some boat was a she, I would just move. I I take I change it. It would always all the boats ended up being it on my on my watch <laughs> because boats are not cheese. It's not it's not an animate object. It's I changed it. That was that was my what I could do. Your contribution to make a change. And um but there was no, there be nothing I could do for you and I I'm I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I just am. Well, you know what? Again, <laughs> we have people watching and listening, but they just happen to be there. This was what we need. We need conversations like this. Mm -hmm. We need honesty like this. We need to to know that okay, that was wrong. It was wrong, and it, it can never be right. And it's wrong for any, any any man anywhere to accept that disrespecting of a woman under any circumstance is okay. Mm -hmm. We can't we can't continue to have that. So again, doing what you're doing, you are you you retired now, right, from the military? Yeah, I didn't retire from the military. I just did a couple of years. I didn't actually retire. Okay, from but you but you I'm, you can you you uh, ended your service with the military I ended my based service. on what? <laughs> When I ended my service, I ended because um, when I had my daughter, I, f I had a wonderful babysitter, but I felt that she was with the babysitter more than she was with me. I would be at work at 5 o'clock in the morning. I don't get home until 5, 6 o'clock in the evening. And then a lot of um, weekends we had to do, you know, 24-hour duty. So I felt that the babysitter was more or less raising her. So I got out because I felt that I didn't want to miss that precious time with her. And so that's what my, when my three, three years was up, I got out because of that. Okay. You get out of the military and say, Hey, I've, I've done my time, <laughs> but I don't want my child to suffer because of my uh, giving my time to the military right. instead of time. To, and, and there's a lot of women out there. You should understand what's being said too. your children should always be first. Mm -hmm. oh my God. I don't care if you're in the military, wherever you are, your children should come first. Mm -hmm. We should never put our children on the back burners right. for any reason whatsoever, even if it's a pretty uniform. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> my, my saving grace was my mother. <laughs> if it hadn't been for my mother, because she watched, uh, well, because I wasn't out of town a lot either, but my mother watched all of the grandkids, my mother just was that type of mother. I'm not that type of grandmother now, but my mother, <laughs> <laughs> my kids would tell me, you're not like uh, grandma. I said, no, I am not like grandma. <laughs> I said, you had the best grandmother you could ever have. I am not like that, no. <laughs> but, um, the reason why I got in the Coast Guard was, you know, for the, the money and everything, but... The reason why I went active was because of my kids. Because I knew 
as long as I was with my kids, the government was going to take care of me. Mm -hmm. And that's just what happened. Government took care of me? That's right. And, and that pretty uniform, too. <laughs> that, oh, listen. My red stripes, <laughs> when I was in um, Marine Safety Office, I used to wear my, na my nails were red to match my uniform. <laughs> <laughs> You just that cool, huh? Oh yeah. What you what you say? Cause you roll like that. I roll like that. <laughs> you, you roll like that. Uh, Kathleen, you want to tell us a little bit about your uh, accommodations and everything on your well, shirt, real quick there. Admiral Rashad, when I retired, uh, President Nixon, I think that's who was in office. Anyway, I didn't want to. They usually give you a a plaque for whatever. So I didn't ask for that. I just, um, I, did, I thought, I'm not going to have him send anything to me with his, with his name on it. And so. You talking about two, Mr. Nixon now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you updated. Two years after uh, Admiral Shaw <laughs> became uh, the chief usher, I told him, I said, I never got. You can set it on the table. Between I you never two got my retirement uh, plaque for. Uh, when I retired, so he said, I'm going to send you one. So he sent me, and uh, President Barack Obama was president then. So he had this made for me for my retirement. That's so sweet. It is. Yeah. That is so sweet. Was, yes. And I thought, oh, wow, I got a black. That is so <laughs> sweet. <laughs> yes, I love it. I love All right. It. Fantastic. I, I was going to, uh, I couldn't find my chief's uniform with the gold braids, but this was my uh, uh, warrant officer uniform, and it wasn't, it's not <clears throat> as sharp. I, I did it because of the the opulets, but it's not as sharp as the chief's uniform. But it's, um, That's okay. It's just, the money's better, oh, but yeah. the uniform, <laughs> yeah, the uniform's not better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, and what are the uh, what, what's on there? What, what's pinned there? Oh, I can't. Oh, I couldn't even begin to tell you what those are. She she could name hers. <laughs> I do know this was our unit became a port security unit. Mm -hmm. That was something else I didn't bargain for in the Coast Guard. In the Coast Guard, you you knew that you were a water safety branch of service, mm -hmm. and they decided well. Lieutenant Rashawn decided he wanted us to go to the Marine Corps in Quantico, Virginia, to learn how to be Marines as Coast Guard people. <laughs> I almost got out <laughs> because I thought, I don't want to be a Marine. I want to be the Coast Guard, and we don't do that. So we went, we did what they call field training exercises. We would go for two weeks we had to set up tents. The guys did. I was administrative, so I didn't have to set up the tents. But administrative people were like 24-7. They set up tents. We had we had to learn to do the M16s, the 45s. Um, we had to be out in the woods. I was she not used like to that. Good, huh? <laughs> I was just that not was used to that. <laughs> <laughs> We had um, fatigues like the Marines. I mean, our, our cute uniform that I really like, we, we exchanged that for fatigues. But uh, there were three port security units, and uh, ours was the first, so that was a symbol for the port security unit. I was so glad to get out of that. I was so glad. I just, that was not part of the deal for me to be a Marine. I did not want to do that. And I remember one of the exercises we were on, it was thundering and lightning. And they wanted us to get in a foxhole. And my mother always told us, go somewhere and sit down and be quiet. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, Mom, I'm out here, excuse me, out here in the rain in a foxhole. And I never did tell her we had to do that. But that was uh, one of the experiences we did as a um, port security unit. They still do that now, so I'm... Um, just, I was so happy to become an officer and go to a totally different unit. 
That's, yeah. That just wasn't me. I'm so you didn't have to dig your foxhole? No, I didn't have to dig. So we had to no. dig our foxhole. So you didn't have to dig. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. And then get in this and do the 24-hour duty in there. Oh, yeah, we no. with that little shovel and, and just carry like, on your waist. You, no, you, you we would have broke have a nail. <laughs> right. You would have broke some nails out there digging a foxhole. Yes. Can't have no red nails over the red suit, huh? <laughs> So <laughs> you probably never had to do that, did you? You probably never had to do that. I, I wanted to go to boot camp. I told I said, I'll go, especially when it was I got accepted to be a company commander. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't let me go. They wouldn't let you go. No, wow. I wanted to go. Because they knew how you rolled. That's, That's right. right. That's right. right. <laughs> so I would have cut my nails to go to boot camp. So <laughs> because actually, um, I was involved involved with the Greater Cleveland Young Marine Program, and um, I was their um, um, their drill person for for that. And we went to camp every, and I loved going to camp. I would I would have been happy doing that. I'm sorry, Kathy. <laughs> that was that was not. You say no. I think you were the first. Reservists that went on active duty that mm. I knew. Really? Yeah. You oh, were okay. First reservist. Mm. Yeah. See, they, they, you had a reputation. Yeah. 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 You had a reputation. Yeah, I she had a rep that way. Right? <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, that's the way she rolled. Everybody knew. She knew exactly how she rolled. We're down to the last four minutes of this, oh, this podcast, but. Uh, I know you didn't bring a uniform or anything, so, but they need to know. You're wearing the Army color. I, I did that. Army, right. I know. You got the I Army green on. Oh, there you go. You know, <laughs> and, 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 you know the eyes. I had so, to represent. So, so, so you did well. Uh, and, and the neck and all this, you all greened up. So you, you, did, you did fantastic. Any closing statements you guys want to make? We're going to make them because uh, we're on the last four minutes of the podcast. So we're going to start with Miss Bobby. Then we're going to Miss Kathy or Kate. Cat, well, you know, whichever one you want to be, because you're everybody. Me everything, so and and and, and then we go to Tan. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you very much for the opportunity to do this. And um, as I told you, I was very excited. And now that it's over, I watch the podcast, and then I'll tell my children. Oh, after you watch it, I gotta see what I look it. like. You gotta like. see what's going on. That's first. right. No, you don't have to wait. Tell them anyway. Just say. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> they want to hear what grandma and mom said and everything. So, I don't want my children to embarrass me because, Ma, why are you so loud? Ma, why are you so loud? Because that's what this I did. This is why she was so loud. <laughs> yep. That was part of it, right? Yep. Okay. Yes. Miss Kathleen. I would like to also. Thank you for the opportunity, and thank John as well for thinking of calling me. Uh, this was very interesting, and uh, it was so good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Uh, yes, I would also like to thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Brother Taylor, um, for thinking of asking me to do this, even though I was reluctant. Very much so. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have done it, though. And we are so grateful for all of you being here and sharing your your stories, uh, your your heart, and that's what this was all about. And eventually, we'd like to have you guys come back on. It's okay to do that too. You you, you are less nervous. Oh, yeah. said, she, what you ask her <laughs> she if she definitely. come back, I'll come back. Huh? <laughs> So we want to thank you once again for joining us here in Unlocking the Power of You. I'm Timothy White Sr. We appreciate you. Look forward to seeing you guys on next week. We're going to continue this military next week. We don't know the guests yet, but we will let you know who's coming up next week. And maybe the final week we'll have men and women from the military because men see things differently than the women. And maybe there will be a great dynamic we can hopefully work from there. So until then, we want to say thank you again. Look forward to seeing you on next week. On KAZ Radio TV. <laughs> <laughs>